It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at karm.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. You're listening to Matt Slick Live. I hope you're all having a good day and that things are working out nicely for you. If you want, you can give me a call. The number is 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six. All right. Today's a nice Friday. We have uh, one caller coming in now. I actually met a guy for uh, coffee this morning, and uh, he's traveling through. And he said, "Hey, I'd like to meet you and have coffee." And and uh, so we did. We had coffee. And uh, he actually asked me. He goes, "Okay, you can do hate mail today." <laughs> and I said, "We're out of hate mail." So we are out of hate mail. Um, so get this. This is. <laughs> You're not going to hear this kind of request very often. So uh, I'm just going to say that if if you're an atheist, a Catholic, a Mormon, and you don't like what I say, or whatever you know, group you're in, uh, send me a hate mail. To, you know, send it to info at karm.org, and you can tell me off. You can tell me how bad I am, how stupid I am, how much I don't know. Uh, unspiritual, whatever it is, and uh, then I can maybe, maybe read it on the air uh, because I love hate mail, and uh, it's really, um, it's it's just it's just, you know, what's the what, I forget where Jesus says, uh, beware when the everyone says you, you know, good of you, I'm like okay, <laughs> well, I know I have detractors, but come on, we need the hate mail, so there you go, all right. Um, also, you can email me if you want a qu- comment or a question for today's show or other shows. And that's just info at karm.org. Info at karm.org. So if you want, you can email me there. And it's easy to do. All you have to do is uh, just do that and put in the subject line radio comment or radio question. Either one of those will be fine. Oh, hey, you're on there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. I wonder how many of you just yawned. I always wonder that when I'm on the radio and I yawn. Um, and how many people are yawning out there? Going, Matt, don't do that. I make me yawn. You never know. All right. I think that's it. We do have some questions, though. Radio comments and questions that people have given me. So we'll get to some of those right after. Right after we get to Luke from Washington. Luke, welcome. You're on the air, buddy. Hi, Matt. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. That's right. Well, that reminds me. We won't be on the air live on Monday. We'll not be doing radio. Just going to give that message out a few times. But, okay, buddy, what do you got, man? Uh, can you uh, explain to me the Presbyterian Church? How did the Presbyterian Church start? What makes Presbyterian different from other Christians? Why did Presbyterian... Uh, I don't, you know, why did the Presbyterian split from the Catholic Church, etc., etc.? Some people ask me. I don't know. Can you give me a brief? When was it started? Sure. It was started by the Reformers. Uh, Presbyterian is from the Greek presbyteros, and it means elder. So the Bible teaches elder rule. It's a let the elders who rule well, First Timothy 5.17. So Presbyterianism is the, uh, the, the, let's see, the generic um, position that a church has, uh, has to be run by elders, one or two or more elders. And basically it started uh, in, uh, I believe, uh, in the 1500s, okay, with the Reformation. So that's what I would say, okay. 1500s is when it started in Scotland, uh, went to England, and then here we are in North America. Okay. What is the difference between Anglicans and the Presbyterians and Baptists? The, I don't know too much about the Anglicans, but the Baptists are generally Arminian, though you can have Reformed Baptists. But the Presbyterians are elder rule, and most of the Baptist churches are too. So... Uh, I, I just don't know all the specific differences, but uh, the Anglican, uh, the Anglican, let's see, I'm trying to remember because, uh, uh, you know, I can't remember. I, there's, I know there's something in the back of my head, but I can't can't uh, recall it. So anyway, okay. Sorry, I wish I could. 
uh one more what about the puritans uh, the history of puritans and presbyterians are, are the same or different the puritans, puritans were from england the puritans were calvinists who came over they're presbyterian the puritans came over in part to escape persecution but mostly to establish a christian nation and when the death rate uh, survival rate of moving from europe to america back in the 15 1600s was i heard someone say 50% so i don't know if that's accurate but it was really a, it's a dangerous uh, journey and i also heard that no presbyterians no puritans ever died uh, in that process they came over here and they wanted to start a christian nation here's a little bit of interesting trivia i forgot the, the name of the indian but the the presbyterians the puritans had built a town i forgot where on the east coast someplace you know in the 1500s and it was winter and they didn't have food they were in a lot of trouble and they what they did was they gathered in the church that they had built and they were praying and asking god to deliver them and someone said look look outside and there was an indian walking down the center area towards the church a single indian and they let him in and the Indian in English said, the Lord has sent me to help you. And he saved their lives by telling them, showing them how to survive, etc. And what had happened was that 15 years earlier, he had been captured, I think by the British or somebody, and, uh, and sent over to England as a slave. And of course, England got rid of slavery but in the meantime, the Indian had learned English and uh, became a Christian and was set free and came back to the Americas and said, this is why God put me there and went through all this stuff in order to help you. Anyway, and so another thing a lot of people don't know is that, and I recommend you read the Constitution and the Preamble of the Preamble of the United States, Preamble of the Constitution and the Constitution. A lot of people have never read it, read, read them. I've read them, they're interesting. And you can see Christian principles woven in. Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the Puritans, when they were established and they were surviving, they wanted a system of government to rule over them. And they asked the ministers to go into God's word and look for the principles that they would then live under. And the Puritans are the ones who developed a representative form of government uh, and voting and uh, the right to bear arms, the right of self-defense, uh, witnessing, uh, trial by peers, and representative, and stuff like that. And so then it, it became part of the culture that then became part of the Constitution of the United States, etc. Okay? A lot of stuff there. So okay. Puritans and Presbyterians are close, uh, close yes. to me? Yeah, Puritans were Presbyterians. They were Calvinists. Okay. Mm. All right. Who are the main Calvinists, uh, uh, Congregationalists, or Puritans, or Presbyterians? The first one. The Presbyterians, from what I understand. Now, I'm not a history buff on this stuff. There's a lot of guys who and girls who know more than I do about this. Uh, so that's what I understand, that they're the ones who, who did this first. Because there was persecution by state religious systems, the Catholics and... Oh, I, remember, I don't want to say that certain another one, but I don't want to say it because I don't want to misrepresent history. And they fled and or came over here to start a Christian nation, risking their lives to do it. So that's what I understand. Okay. All right. Yeah. Any book uh, you recommend to read all this history? No, I don't uh, know about it. Presbyterian history? No, I don't, uh, okay. I don't know. I don't have any books that I've read about that. Now, if anybody has a book that they would recommend that goes over this, the early history, the beginnings of it, uh, you know, I'd love to, to, to see that, or even some articles, because it is worth researching and writing on. But, you know, I do apologetics mostly, not just history. But, you know, it's a good question, and um, that's what I know about it. Okay. So why then a Presbyterian church has pastors now? They have elders and pastors. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't understand you. Why what? You said Presbyteros means elders, First Timothy 5 or something. First and then uh, yeah. uh, I go to Presbyterian church, but uh, they, we have pastor and teaching elders, ruling elders. How come? Yes. Yeah. 
because the Bible says, if I go to 1 Timothy 5.17, it says this, uh, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So right there you see that there's a group of elders among whom are those who do preaching and teaching. This is uh, out of Ephesians 4.11, which says that uh, God gave to the church some apostles. It literally says in the Greek, the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and teachers. So the pastors and teachers, the pastors are the ones who do the preaching and they're also teachers. So the first timothy 5:17 reflects out of that those who work hard at preaching and teaching and so generally considered they're them to be a single office so there's others uh, other offices and out of that they derive the presbyterian ideas of teaching elder you know uh, visitation elder and things like that okay all uh, right thank you all right okay luke god bless buddy okay Hey, folks, we have wide open lines. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. I hope you want to give me a call. We have nobody waiting. And what I'm going to do at this point is just tell you that we stay on the air by your support. Please consider supporting us um, if you'd be so kind as to go to uh, just carm.org forward slash donate, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G forward slash donate. Uh, if you'd be so kind, we could definitely use that support. A lot of ministries need it. And if you are getting fed here, please consider supporting us. Because as I heard someone say, if you get fed at McDonald's, you don't go pay at Burger King. So, uh, you know, I'm saying if you're getting fed and you're, and you're learning, uh, please consider supporting us. It's taken me decades to acquire what I, I know can be able to help you out. So, hey, pr- praise God, okay? Carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G forward slash donate. We have nobody calling right now, so what I'm going to do is get to the e- I mean, yeah, to get, where did it go? Get to the emails. Oh, we go, come on, where we go? There we go. And we've got some good radio questions that have come in, so I'm going to get to some of those. Uh, I've already done that one. So let's go here. Let's see. Now, can Satan put thoughts in a Christian's mind? I don't believe so. I've written an article on that, and nothing that I'm aware of in Scripture says that it's possible. Now, we, you know, we sometimes ask, well, what's going on? Because you'll be praying, and all of a sudden, or just all of a sudden, you'll have this weird thought. Well, is that the devil? Well, you know, what I would say is that... Um, uh, I don't know if the devil can, so to speak, whisper, uh, influence you or whatever. He cannot be in you, not if you're a Christian. So when we ask this or answer the question, it's kind of difficult to answer because we really don't know exactly how everything works. So best I can do is say, it does not appear that he can put any thoughts into your mind because he had to be in you to do that, and that can't happen. Are there ways for him to have external influences upon you in a negative way, we would definitely say yes. Where then do these weird thoughts come from that you get? They come from your own nature, your own sinfulness. Hey folks, we have nobody waiting. Why don't you give me a call? 877-207-2276. We will be right back. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, the number is 877-207-2276. If you want to give me a call, also you can email me, info at carm.org, info at C-A-R-M dot O-R-G. All right, so I was going through some of the hate mail, not hate mail, but the uh, email questions and things like that, and I saw one. I got a big kick out of it. Um, and because we have no callers, I'm going to spend a little time on it. Please give me a call if you want. But it's uh, the email is defending the Catholic faith against the Matt Slicks of the world. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And so I would go through, I'm going to take a look at it. Um, uh, 
let's see. Well, let's see. Let's see. So, um, let's see. I was a Protestant Christian from childhood, well until the 40s. I get the Protestant position. But Anti-Catholicism, it exists. Matt Slick is only one of many examples. Hey, I feel honored. He's one of the key individual names that I come across as I began to research Catholicism. It didn't take long to figure out that he had a lot of things wrong that he cherry-picks to attempt to make a point. His interpretations, in many instances, are just that. His interpretations. He's very anti-Catholic, in my opinion. That is true. I'm, very, and I'm not anti-Catholic, I should say. I'm anti-Catholicism. Okay, His tone is not as bad about Catholics as I've seen as some. Okay, now, I'm waiting for something good. Uh, let's see, Maslick has written plenty about Catholicism, as you can see right here, and he puts a link. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's content it's content like this that causes me to want to know more about Catholicism. Um, I want to defend the Catholic faith. Why? It's idolatrous false stuff. Anyway, from people like Matt Slick, because it, he was... <laughs> because it sickens me to uh, see misuse of scripture. Oh, I wish he'd call me. Oh, it'd be great. Uh, let's see. John Martignoni, uh, that he has a lot of respect for. I th the thing that I like about Catholic apologists is that the foundation is the position of the Catholic Church, not just a free for all. Cherry picking a few. <laughs> scriptures to attempt to prove the point. Uh, there's a lot of apologists he lists. Um, Got a position to be far better than the match slicks. <laughs> of the other. Why do I get a kick out of this? What is with me that I enjoy stuff like this? I just do. So, um, ooh, someone wrote uh, an article, Matt Slick's False Teachings. And I could even click on that and see what happened. Just like a tree of things. Uh, let's see. I'm taking all this stuff. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's, it's way too long, of course. Can't get into it. I was hoping for something of substance. Uh, let's see. Hey, did you know that Catholicism is not Christian according to Matt Slick? <laughs> yeah, it's easy to just grab one line from anything that is out of context and not show. Well, it's not Christian. <laughs> but we can go into that. Uh so he's not saying anything. He's just, just repeating what I'm saying without any, any response. Spend time on Catholic.com. Yeah, right. Um, how should Catholics combat the Matt Slicks of the world? I guess I'm a whole category now. Pray for starters. Well, who is starters? It says pray for starters. Who is that? However, learning the Catholic faith better would be better would be very helpful get a copy of the catechism of the catholic church you oh man oh that thing's so full of heresy download the the app from the uh you know, that's right from catholic link. and so here's an idea start a bible study group that dives into the anti-catholic rhetoric like people of mad slick in other words break it down to see the real catholic position and how the anti-catholics twist what they he hasn't said one thing one thing he hasn't said that I've done wrong. He says, he says it's wrong, but he's, he's wrong about that. See, that's what gets me. It just He doesn't defend anything. doesn't give me anything solid. He just kind of says, go to other churches. Yeah, and he's got pictures of, you know, just sacerdotalists. Sacerdotalists. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of the stuff that, that's on the web. Um, bad news. Yeah, just so you know, ladies and gentlemen, Roman Catholicism is not Christian. It's an apostate uh, false church. It teaches works righteousness. It uh, elevates Mary to a position that is just basically a goddess. Uh, it has a false priesthood and a false Eucharistic uh, view. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff there. Let's get to Pearl from Rockville, Virginia. Pearl, welcome. You are on the air. I just want to praise God for you, sir, Matt Slick. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of hard to satisfy when it comes to spiritual things. My favorite is uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul. And, yeah, he's uh, good. He's good. And uh, McDonald. I can't think of his first name. Anyway, what I want to ask you, sir, is isn't it true that the and I don't, I'm not, 
I don't know of another adjective to just describe God in this way. He's not a thing, of course. But isn't it true that the only thing that satisfies God Almighty is God Almighty? Ultimately, yes. Because only He is good enough for His own perfection and holiness. He requires nothing less. So that's than right, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now we okay. can say that you know He indwells us, and we can please Him by seeking, even in our failures and our imperfection, as we seek to honor Him and to live for Him, and that that pleases Him. But even that has to be. Um, filter to the blood of Christ so yeah okay good stuff and that we are saved through the most precious priceless powerful substance that ever touched planet earth and that's the precious blood of the Lord Jesus amen that is absolutely true it's absolutely correct yep Mm -hmm. pastors don't teach the blood very much well, maybe they don't teach very much. That might be the case. Uh, uh, and let me ask you this, sir. Isn't it true that God alone is love? And he is teaching those that belong to him every day closer and closer to being lost in his love because that's the only love that there is that's the only true love that there is yeah he's the source i didn't of hear love. you sir yeah he's the source of love and his but nature is he to... the only he is love yep yes first right. john 4 8 he's love he's the mm-hmm. source of all love he's the standard of all that is loving and good that that's him okay yeah well, I just want to ask you, sir, because you, I thank God for you. I praise God for you. And that you, and I hope you don't get off the radio because it's, um, you delve into the, I would say the deep things of God is what I love. And you don't often hear that in, That's in true. the church. It's true. Churches. That's right. They often so they I don't. want to thank you, okay. and I, I, uh, okay. the Lord There's Jesus brought your dear wife to me today when I was in prayer, that oh, He would good. heal thank her. You. Well, there's a, thanks a lot, Pearl. We really appreciate it. There's a break we had to go, so God bless and thanks for calling. Okay. When He so, puts something again. else in my mind, I'll call you. <laughs> okay. God bless. Okay. Hey, folks. Be right back after these messages. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, the number is 877-207-2276. So, last night, I did something interesting. I went to uh, Oculus. You know, it's, a, it's a thing you put over your eyes. You can go into uh, the virtual world, and I, I have it in order to witness and that's what I do now the one I have is old but it, it gets it done it's blurry and not that good but I wish I had a new one but that's okay I went in and the funny thing is I wasn't even thinking about it I was just working on something and all of a sudden pop in my head real clear go 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 in there and I literally just stopped what I was doing and I put it on and I went into this room and within just a few minutes I'm there, and this I go into this place, and uh, it's a room, and there's like 10 people in it that are avatars, and you can see 3D. It's really cool. And uh, this guy goes, oh, hey, you're Matt Slick. And he, I, we'd interacted before. He says, everybody, look, listen, this is Matt Slick. He uh, answers questions and teaches and stuff like that. It was really nice, you know, a nice opening. And people started asking me questions. And I ended up teaching for about 45 minutes and answering questions. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because of what Pearl said. And Pearl said, in the last caller, she said uh, that uh, people, the pastors aren't really teaching much, uh, very deep stuff anymore. Okay, so that caused me to think about what happened last night, because in the Oculus, you have a device in each hand, and you can move, you can 
go forward, backward, you can go up and down, you can jump, you can do all kinds of stuff. And you have these things, you can raise your hand, you can put your fingers. And um, so I said, okay, in the room here, how many of you here are Christians? This is, you know, after 20 minutes of talking and, and stuff. And, you know, the majority of the people wrote, raised their hand. I said, okay, for the Christians, I'm going to just ask you a question. And I said, is Jesus a man right now? And the ones who answered all said, no, which is false. And I didn't jump on him. I just said, okay, and, you know, what's the Trinity? And I think I remember saying, that, asked that, and they didn't know. Now, these are Christians. And it reminded me, uh, what Pearl said reminded me of that encounter, which is surprisingly very typical in Christian churches where they don't know stuff. Now, I'm not saying that pastors are horrible, but it's just that the Christians across the board can't even tell me what the Trinity is or how many natures Jesus has or what's the, the difference between justification and sanctification. Now, I know Christians who can. I know some guys and girls who they can, they can articulate it very well, but they're very, very few. They're the people who kind of float to the surface uh, in things and you get to know them. But for the most part, when I go to seminars and I go to stuff and I ask questions, uh, do some teaching, uh, Christians just across the board don't know anything. That's a concern. It is a big concern. And uh, it's a concern. I think Christians need to be taught not only uh, what it means to satisfy God in your walk with him and turn to Christ, but it also requires pastors should be teaching what the doctrines of the faith really are. And I don't think they do that very much. And I don't know why. I, I just don't know why. Uh, in First Timothy 6.1, it says, All who are under the yoke of slaves are to regard uh, with their own masters uh, as worthy of double honor, or excuse me, of honor, so that the name of our Lord and our doctrine will not be spoken against. And in First Timothy 6.3, If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words, etc., and he says uh, in First Timothy 6, uh, 3, again, he says, with doctrines conforming to godliness. And Second Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to hear their ears, have their ears tickled. Uh, in, first, in Titus 1, 9, it says that the, uh, the elder, a pastor is an elder, uh, is supposed to be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. And Titus 2.1, uh, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. In Titus 2.7, and all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine. Uh, Titus 2.10, uh, is to put showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. So it's there in Scripture. I'm just puzzled. I am. Why is it pastors aren't teaching it, or are they? I don't know. Let's get to Jacob from Missouri. Jacob, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. Um, hey. I had a, an analogy for the Trinity that I wanted to run by you. All right. Go ahead. So mm -hmm. it, it helped me kind of under... Uh, understand it and grasp it um it's so imagine god being um being like water that's surrounding the world and then okay. jesus is like a droplet of that um of god of the water that came down into human form is that kind of a good analogy for that and like the holy spirit think... kind of mist that surrounds everything um I can see a value in that illustration when you want to say that Christ has divine quality in nature and became one of us, and that the presence of God around us is there like that water, and then a drop came down. It's that water, by, that drop by definition is just as much water as the whole and became one of us. I could see that, but um, it, it has a potential of denying then where the Holy Spirit fits in because how would you then fit him right. in in this so that's why I would I wouldn't use that one the analogy that I found that is the best that I've heard of is 
relating it to time. Time is one thing, and it's just nature is time. But time has three aspects. Don't say parts. Don't say parts, but say aspects. Past, present, and future. Each one of them is distinct from the other, but is by nature still time. And we abs- we are aware of their distinction as they relate to each other. So the past happened before the present. The future happens after the present. So there's a relationship between them, and that's where we draw their distinction. The same way God is one substance with three, and we instead of aspect here, we'll say persons, and we discover their relationship or their identi- their distinction in their relationship to one another. This way, the people can get what time is and see the equality of all, by analogy, of all three persons, and that uh, they are differentiated by their relationship to one another. Okay? Okay, yeah, wow, that that helps. And that's perfect, it's time with the three, uh, you said aspects, not properties? I don't say properties. Properties emanate out of the out of the ontos, and for someone who might be knowledgeable about difference between properties and ontos, uh, you might get into some trouble. And that's why I say aspect because it's vague enough that they can't just jump in. If they say, well, "What do you mean by aspect?" You say, "Well, you know, I just go back to what the, what time is. It's past, present, and future." And then sometimes I'll even say, "It's time has." We could say it has parts, but I don't want to. I'll say to them, "But I don't want to use the word part because that's not what Christian Trinitarianism is." But I'm just giving you an analogy how one thing can have three aspects to it: past, present, and future, all be one substance, but they you understand them in relationship to one another, and then it's revealed to us, and uh, that's how it is in the Trinity. Okay. All right. I love it. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, God bless. All right. God bless. Okay. All right. Now, let's get to Laura from Utah. Laura, welcome. You're on the air. Well, hello, hello. Hey, Laura. Who works with me? I had to sneak outside and run. (laughs) What's that? I thought I had to sneak outside and run for a minute because I got so many computer screens going and noises so I could call you. All right. Remember, it is uh, Laura. She so works I, with us. She's great. So what do you got? You know, you know it, it's a blessing to work with Carm, and I'm going to throw it out there. Everybody needs to go to Carm.org. Matt has written so many articles that are just so important for us to, to read and to glean and to learn so that we can we can know the truth. But my question is, I keep seeing with so many, um, so many people keep saying that we need to leave politics out of church. And they're just adamantly against. And we've had people leave church if politics are brought up. And just wanted to know your take on that. Yes, ch- politics does need to be in the church. The pastor needs to talk about issues that relate to politics because all things are under the subjection and sovereignty of God. And if a Christian thinks that politics is excluded from that, then the Christian does not have a good biblical theological position. We don't want to say that God should stay out of our kitchen. Of course he should be in our kitchen. Uh, our bedroom, of course he should be there. Now, I'm not talking about him person and being in you know, bed, but I mean the idea of the sovereignty of God in all areas of our lives, how we drive, how we work, everything. Now, why would people then say politics has to be the exception? And the Christian who would say such a thing has to defend the position that politics is something we should not do and uh, in, from the pulpit. And so I can't see that as being biblical. And there you go. Okay? We have a- break. Amen. I agree, Matt. Thank you. All right, Laura, God bless. Thanks for calling. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. We have nobody waiting right now. If you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial 8 7 7 2 I'm going to be at your Belinda in Southern California uh, speaking at a conference uh, on, it'll be two weeks I'll be down there, 
on Friday the 13th, I'll be flying in. So I'll be speaking uh, on, I'll be on a panel on Friday evening, and I'll be speaking three times, doing three workshops or whatever it is, on the 14th and preaching at Norco, Calvary Chapel, Norco, uh, on the 15th, two sermons. So there you go, and um, be doing that. And next week, uh, hey, let me check this out. Yeah, next week, yeah, next week I'm going to go down to Provo, Utah, to hear uh, Ed. Oh, just a friend. He's a good guy. I'm going to go down there and uh, see him, see him preach. And I always tease him. He's a good guy. I always tease him. Like I'm going to sit in the front row and just bug out my eyes. Like you said what? And uh, give him a hard time, but no, I'm just going to sit in the back and just enjoy uh, him preach the Word of God. So that'll be, uh, you know, on the 7th and 8th. I'll be down there doing that. We drive down on Saturday, come back on a Sunday. You know, just stuff. So there you go. And maybe we'll, we'll be, I'll say hi to Terry if she's listening. Because a lot of times I know Terry. She's at her kitchen or doing stuff for the family. And I mention her name and she always smiles. And so she's great. Be staying over there. So, uh, Ed prefers me over James White for what? Looks <laughs> or buffoonery? So, it just depends. <laughs> it just depends. <laughs> well, what's he looking at? Um, or um, am I more humble? Yeah, yeah I'm more humble than, than James. You know? <laughs> that wouldn't work either. So, at any rate, just having fun. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, Humble Clay, you're going to hit Newport or Huntington Beach, Matt? Uh, you should hook up with ban- <laughs> the Banana Man. I have no idea who what that is. I haven't been to Huntington Beach in a long time. The last time I was down there, uh, though, uh, this is the last time, the second to last time, anyway, it was years ago, I, I was down there, and uh, Ray Comfort was preaching. And I go, hey, look, there's Ray, you know. And, and uh, so I'm in the crowd just watching, and he sees me. And uh, long story short, he goes, come up here, your turn. <laughs> So I started doing some open air preaching. It was fun. He's a good guy. All right, now let's get back to let's get back to some of the uh, comments and questions. You know, I was looking for the the Catholic stuff, though. I was hoping, I was hoping that uh, that they would um, do do something more, but besides just just talk in circles without getting any substance. Let's see. Here's a in, in, my next email. Coincidentally, is. Uh, Brother Matt, my question is on Roman Catholicism and suppliant omnipotence. Suppliant omnipotence? They dedicate a day to Mary and they, oh, I see, to supplication. Um, supplicant, it should be not suppliant. They dedicate a day to Mary and they say, supply, suppliant? i got to check to see if that's the right word. Omnipotence. Please explain this. I, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that. I'm going to look that up and see if there's an actual phrase because I'm still learning about Catholicism. I don't have all the all the stuff down on what it is. Um, let's see if there's a phrase that works like that. Uh, yeah, suppliant omnipotence is a paradoxical concept that posits a being who is both all powerful and also in need of supplication. What? This idea often arises in religious or philosophical context paradox being wished all powerful and need and in need creates a logical contradiction what well that's not christian thought so i'm not sure what uh what that is about i'm not sure what that's about hey folks if you want to give me a call 877-207-2276 i just had a thought and the reason i'm thinking about something here i'm thinking about the, the three online schools i've just found out before the radio show that there's a problem with the schools and our web guy is uh, in contact with the firm that produced the software in which the the schools run and that there's a problem and they're working on solving it i mean it's a i don't know what the problem is exactly i've heard people say they sign up and then there's a little problem they can't see the schools we have to give them access it should already be there automatically i think that's what the problem is but if you have uh, taken the schools, I want to hear what you have to say. If you can call me up really fast, let me know. But I'm also interested in something else. Maybe people could let me know. You could even email me or call up and say, you know, I'd like to see a, a CARM school on on a particular topic. Because I have, uh, I have schools on theology, on apologetics, and I have schools on uh, a school on critical thinking. 
and I've thought about writing one for uh, biblical interpretation, and I've also thought about doing stuff like uh, how to learn to witness to the Catholics or learn what Catholicism really teaches and have a school like here's what the premises are, here's this, here's this, and you go through and you take you do questions and answers as you go through like fifty lessons or something like that, and I could do that. So I am curious. So those who are listening on Rumble, or and or those who are listening um, on uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook, you can let me know. I want to know. I want to know. And I think uh, Laura said hermeneutics, which is how to interpret scripture. I've written on that before, and I could teach on it. So anyway, that's a thought. You know, it's a thought. I got so much to do. Let's see. Uh, this person, the, the email says, asked a, an, a Catholic brother a question about it and got skated around with no answer. Instead, he attacked my own in- <laughs> interpretation. Uh, so I don't know what the question is, so I'm sorry. Okay, let's can't, can't answer it. Okay. Let's try this. Um, I have some concerns regarding uh, your article about the concept of Adiaphora. Now, Adiaphora, ladies and gentlemen, is the uh, teaching uh, is the that there are doctrines that are not essential to the Christian faith that you can affirm or deny certain aspects and you're still a Christian. That's what Adiaphora is. All right, uh, like you explain, Adiaphora refers to beliefs and practices that are non-essential, etc. Uh, he agrees. What's confusing me is you also say in the article that pre-trib rapture or post-trib rapture would be a non-essential, so it would be Adiaphora. While it is true some Christians might consider it to be Adiaphora, I don't think it is accurate to say it's definitely Adiaphora. Well, I'm confused because he just defines it properly and then says that it's not Adiaphora. But pre trib, post trib rapture debate, both are acceptable uh, within the Christian worldview and does not negate someone's faith in Christ because of either one. Anyway, he goes on. Because if a Christian sincerely believes pre-tribulation rapture is the scriptural view, it wouldn't be Adiaphora in their eyes. It would be the scriptural view. Okay. No. Adiaphora is that person has a view they believe is biblical, but it's not, uh, but it's an opinion. Like, for example, there are people who believe that the scriptures teach that, that will be raptured out before the tribulation. Others, like myself, teach we're going to go through the tribulation, we raptured out after it. Both of those positions cannot be true in the same time in the same sense. But if I hold to post-trib and someone else holds to pre-trib, it doesn't mean they're a Christian or not a Christian. It just means they hold to a position which is not stated as being an essential doctrine of the Christian faith. Essential doctrines are those things that are stated as being essential, like Jesus says in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sin. So you've got to believe he is the I am, John 8, 24, or his physical resurrection in John, uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 17, Paul says, he repeats himself, he says that uh, if Christ be not raised, our faith is in vain. So that's an essential doctrine of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Christ. But nothing in the Bible says, thou shalt believe in preach of rapture, otherwise thou shalt go to hell. There's nothing that says a statement like that which would then declare it as being an essential. No, it's an adiaphora. It is a non-essential, which means there's a range of doctrines that people can believe in and have differences of opinion on, and it still be okay, still be true. That's what's going on. That's what it means. And so Adiaphora includes the rapture, uh, the millennium, and things like that. Okay. Hope that helped. So now let's see if we can get to another one. Can you please answer this question on the radio? Uh, are there any examples in the Bible of God, Jesus, changing his mind? None I'm aware of, of Jesus, but there are places in the Old Testament where it says God changed his mind. And so what do we do with those? Well, the, I have a whole section written on this kind of stuff dealing with open theism. Open theism is the position that the future is open because God can't know what your free will choices are going to be because if he knew what they're going to be, then you're not free any well anymore. And that's illogical, but that's what they hold. And so one of the things they will do is cite 
uh, instances where God says, you know, he repented of this or he you know, changed God's mind and it does this and that. So the general response to them is simple. God is speaking to us in human terms, not in the divine uh, relationship, that he will do something and then alter what he said he would do. For example, he said he was going to destroy Nineveh, and uh, he didn't. Well, does that mean that God made a mistake? No, it does not, because when you go to, for example, Rev, uh, Jeremiah 18.8, God says, if that nation against which I have spoken turns, spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. So God can say to a nation, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to do this to you, I'm going to do that to you. And then that motivates them to turn from their sin, they repent, and God says, okay, I won't. So God knew the ultimate truth that they were going to repent, but part of the requirement of their repentance was God saying what he did to get them to repent. So then God can say that, uh, I'm going to do this. And then he says, okay, well then. But he gives the conditions why. And this is uh, dealing with the issue of the now, the not yet, and some other theological perspectives. That's the, uh, the first level answer. All right. So let's try this one. Here's a question. Listening to the show right now in Clubhouse, uh, this is from, when is this? Oh, this is a while back. My question for you is this. What are your views on lordship salvation versus free grace theology? Lordship salvation is the idea. There's a bit of a variation in its teaching understanding, but it's the idea that Jesus has to be lord of every aspect of your life in order to be a true Christian and saved. Free grace theology generally says you, you're just saved by grace through faith and you go out and sin, and it's okay. Uh, both of those have their problems, obviously, and we're running out of time here to be able to get to them. But we don't have to make Lord of er Jesus Lord of everything in our lives in order for him to be Lord or be our Savior. We don't make him Lord of every single area of our life, and up, but upon that condition that we do, he becomes our Savior. That's not true. He is that automatically, which is even including government. We've got to be, make sure of that. Free grace theology uh, violates First uh, John 2, 4. Uh, you say you know him, but, but don't keep his commandments, and the truth is not in you, and you're a liar. We don't want to say that we're just saved by grace, and then we can go sin and actually go out and do it, and then deny the truths of God's word and, and what he requires of us. That would be a, a mistake. Both of those uh, exaggerations would be error and heretical. All right, so there you go. I am out of time. The music's going to start here in a few seconds. I just want to let everybody know we will not be live on the air on Monday because it's uh, a holiday. And so we'll be back on the air live on the radio on Tuesday next week. And uh, may the Lord bless you. And please consider supporting us. We uh, would need that, and we would just appreciate it. Go to carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G forward slash radio. That would be awesome. I mean, not radio forward slash donate, I'm thinking. May the Lord bless you. Have a great weekend, everybody. God bless. We'll talk to you uh, next week. <laughs>